Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, Rest in Christ. And this particular lesson, number 11 in that series, is entitled, Longing for More. And it's a lesson for September 11 of 2021. We'd like to do as we usually do and begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we have come now seeking for more, seeking to understand you more clearly, to understand all the blessings that you intended for us to enjoy. May that be more apparent to us this study as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Queen's Museum of Art in New York the United States houses the world's largest architectural model of a city, depicting all the buildings of New York on a scale of 1 to uh, 1,200, where 2.5 centimeters or 1 inch corresponds to 33 meters or 100 feet. It covers nearly 870 square meters or 9,335 uh, square feet. How does that compare with the size of a house? Big. It's big. Uh, our home, at, I think, is 2,800 square feet. So this is three or four times as big as our entire house. We have, we have two stories. It was originally completed in 1964 by 100 craftsmen who had worked for more than three years to complete the project. It has been updated to the 1990s and does not reflect the 2021 landscape, cityscape. It is an amazingly intricate and detailed copy of the original. In the end, though, it is still just that, a copy, a model, a representation of something grander, bigger, deeper, and much more intricate, intricate than the model itself. From our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath, September 4. So what does all that stuff about models mean? The scripture is full of metaphors, similes, and miniature models of activities and institutions that all point to larger heavenly realities. We will focus this lesson on, particularly on the teachings of Hebrews 4 in this study. Paul said some very challenging words in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. Jim? I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, that whatever happened to our ancestors who followed Moses, they were all under the protection of the cloud, and it passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread, drank the same, excuse me, and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. Now let me interrupt for just a moment. This is one of the clearest texts in the Bible. There are others. I mean, in the New Testament, suggesting that Jesus was, or Christ was, the God of the Old Testament. Okay? But even then, God was not pleased with most of them, and so their dead bodies were scattered over the desert. Now, How many of them didn't die in the desert? How many of that generation didn't die? Two. Who were they? Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua. These are the ones who are 20 years and older. Well, there's a third one that didn't die. He had a special case, and that was... I guess not, that's not true. He did die. <laughs> yes, but God did. raised him and took him to heaven. Moses. Okay, go ahead. Now all, that is a, now, all this is an example for us to warn us not to desire evil things as they did, nor to worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people sat down at the feet excuse me, to a beast which turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. We must not be guilty of sexual immorality as some of them were, and in one day, 23,000 of them fell dead. Numbers 25. That, sto that story is in November's 25, Numbers 25. Go ahead. We must not put the Lord to the test as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. Numbers 21, verses 5 and 6. We must not complain, as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the angel of death. Numbers 16, verses 41 to 
49. All these things happened to them as examples for others, and they were written down as a warning for us. For we live at a time when the end is about to come. American Bible Society, 1992. Okay. You know, when they came out of the, uh, to the Jordan uh, River, they, they're, they're, the last 40 years they came out just as a bunch of pagans. Remember mm -hmm. Amos 4.25 and, and following? And then it was restated by uh, uh, Stephen in his sermon there. At, uh, well, look at, look at uh, the, the story. Right there, we're gonna, we'll look a bit more about that further on here, but um, right there on the plains of Moab across from Jericho, they were, they were involved with that fertility cult stuff and those ladies who came from Midian and Moab and right there. I mean, they were just, it was time, they were standing there waiting to cross the Jordan. Here they are right next to Moses who's one of the men who was closest, one of the people, not just men, but people that was closest to God ever, mm -hmm. and they're doing this. Yeah. It's almost like they learned nothing in, in 40 years. <laughs> Twice in this passage from 1 Corinthians, Paul used the Greek word typos, which suggests that some kind of symbolic representation or model of something else. So what models are we talking about in this lesson? Hebrews 5, 8, 5, the work they do as priests is really only a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. It is the same as it was with Moses. When he was about to build the sacred tent, God said to him, be sure to make everything according to the pattern you were shown on the mountain. So how much of this ceremony is going on in heaven? We know, we know that no animals are being killed in heaven. We're now in the antitypical Day of Atonement. How does all that affect us? Well, considering what it says in Hebrews 8, we need to remember these words from Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 4. The Jewish law is not a full and faithful model of the real things. It is only a faint outline of the good things to come. Now, let me interrupt there for a moment. Don't you suppose that when he, mention, when he mentions the real things, he's talking about heaven? Yeah. Right. Seems like it. Okay, go ahead. The same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year. How can the law then, by the means of these sacrifices, make perfect the people who come to God? If the people worshiping God had really been purified from their sins, they would not feel guilty of sin anymore and all the sacrifices would stop. Now let's, let's talk about that for a moment. Let's think through this, what he's trying to say to us here. If, the, if you went down there to the tent and you took a lamb and you sacrificed that lamb and you, uh, the blood was carried in all the ceremonies the way it was supposed to be, and if that perfectly resolved all the sin in your life, you shouldn't be able to go away and never sin again, right? So it didn't work, did it? Because they kept on sinning. So that's what he's talking about here. I'll read that again. If the people worshiping God had really been purified from their sins, they would not feel guilty of sin anymore, and all the sacrifices would stop. As it is, however, the sacrifices serve year after year to remind people of their sins, for the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. Now we're gonna, we're gonna see some very interesting words to compare with that a little bit later. If the sacrifices of the Old Testament never really purified people from their sins, and all that it did was to remind them of their sins, what should that teach us? Moses was instructed to build the tabernacle or tent according to the pattern he was shown by God. What should that tell us about what is actually happening there in heaven? Did God not only give Moses some picture of a model of what the sanctuary was supposed to look like, but also a lot of details about how the worship services were supposed to be carried out or carried on? Is that what we have in the book of Leviticus? 
somewhere he got those very explicit instructions. He got them from God somehow. Yeah. Well, look back at the story of the Israelites wandering those 40 years from Egypt to Canaan. We have recorded many separate incidents of things that happened. How many of them are examples for us? Should we be following the example of Korodathan and Abiram? <laughs> Should we be following the example of Nadab and Abihu? Perish the thought. Okay. Are there some good examples as well as some bad examples? Why were the Hebrew men and women, I asked a question about that, so easily attracted by the fertility cult services which the pagans followed? Almost 40,000 died as a result of becoming involved on two separate occasions with this, these fertility cult worships. 40,000 people. What do you think they actually died of? What killed them? The, the 23,000 or 24,000 that died there on the plains of Moab, just ready to cross the Jordan River into the land. And here they got involved with these women who came down there and uh, whatever they did, I don't know, but... Well, you, <clears throat> one could speculate that it maybe was syphilis, but syphilis doesn't kill that quickly. Other venereal diseases don't kill that quickly. No. Was it some COVID? <laughs> was it some infectious disease? Does it say the sword of the Lord or of the angel? Or mm -hmm. It had to be very quick. Yeah. It, so it maybe it was it. just playing the angel of the Lord. The, right. I mean, it had to well, be. Yeah, but we've got to remember, just if it, we called it an angel of the Lord. Was Satan one, an angel of the Lord? Once upon mm -hmm. a time. Yeah. It, it just, just because it's a danger doesn't mean it's a good one. Well, in this case, well, do you, do you wish that we still were doing some of those ceremonies today? Could you sacrifice a lamb in order to get forgiveness for your sins? Um, did they really feel forgiven after doing that? Was, did it change their thinking? It, it's not an issue of forgiveness. Yeah. It's did it change their thinking, their attitudes? Mm -hmm. Were they learning anything? Not okay. very much. Gordon, I think you're next. Do we learn much? <laughs> so, from Good News Bible, Leviticus 4, 32. If a man brings a sheep as a sin offering, it must be a female without any defects. He shall put his hand on the head and kill it on the north side of the altar, where the animals for the burnt offerings are killed. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood of the animal, put it on the projections at the corners of the altar, and pour out the rest of it at the base of the altar. An awful lot of blood. Mm -hmm. Then he shall remove all its fat, just as the fat is removed from the sheep killed for the fellowship offerings. And he shall burn it on the altar along with the food offerings given to the Lord. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question. How well does fat burn? It burns quickly. Mm -hmm. Being a vegetarian, I don't know. <laughs> I think well, it burns. Fat is fat. It will burn. Well, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would have thought so. I mean, we make they they muscles they, will not burn so quickly. Candles and yeah, right. uh, yeah, candles and things are made out of fat. Right, right. But muscles, for example, <coughs> yeah. skin will not. But fat will burn fairly yeah. quickly. I got a question. Not too many places in Leviticus you find a female. That's right. This is one of the probably one or two places only. It's very specific. One year. Male without blemish. But most of the time. Most yeah. of the time. Right. And this, in this, this time, a female, female without yeah. any defect. Right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, at, at, continuing. In this way, the priest shall offer the sacrifice for the man's sin, and he will be forgiven. He will be forgiven. Does that mean, if we believe that the Lord is forgiveness personified, is he forgiven before he even does that? Mm -hmm. He's forgiven, but as Jim would say, is he changed in his thinking? Yeah. Is he Did, changed in his wiring, his what, hard wiring? What, what was that text again? Let's That's, take a look. Uh, Deuteronomy 4. Leviticus 4.32. Yeah, Did ritual serve as very good educators for the children of Israel? Apparently not. Surely if a ritual is practiced again and again, they would become quite familiar with it. What do you think about the very specific details regarding the many sacrifices? They were told when, where, and what 
procedural details needed to take place for each sacrifice. No, but, but, but if it became a ritual, it, it lost the whole purpose for it to be there. I mean, if, yeah. if so, Gordon had a pet, a dog, you see, as well, whatever, Gordon is now seven years old, you see, so, uh, well, if you disobey your mom or if you don't do the dishes, the dog is going to go. He'll think twice. I mean, I mean, I come to think that a young man brings his lamb to be killed, his special lamb. Yeah. I mean, I think it had to tear his heart apart to do that. Yeah. So, but if it becomes a ritual, then that's why you had to buy the lamb instead of to. instead of being the one that you raised. Is that I'm, being a, no, I'm being a little sarcastic there. But, but all of this goes to this God pleased with all of this stuff. How many of you with Micah Mike, Mike 6, yeah. 6 through 8? Right. Do, do I want that? No, I don't want it. In fact, don't bring me any of that. I don't even want your, your, I don't even want your prayers. I don't want your noisy hymns. Just listen and take instructions. Same, uh, Isaiah 58 also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And Isaiah 1. Yeah. And modern times, we feel that many rituals de uh, deteriorate into mindless practices. Right. Surely that is not what God wanted. And it's obvious that in these rituals, there was a great deal of killing. The shedding of blood and the sprinkling of the blood on various places in the tabernacle. This was a very messy process. It was ugly. It was not supposed to be attractive because it represented the results of sin. So what it's hard to even imagine the priest sticking his finger in the blood mm -hmm. and then putting it on the corners of the altar, on the also corners on the of the altar. Earlobe. Earlobe, yeah. Yes. And pouring it out at the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. It's hard to imagine. What do you suppose was the reason for putting the blood on the horns of the altar? Did the children of Israel understand clearly exactly what each one of those sacrifices was supposed to mean? And the significance of blood? Leviticus 17, 11. Now we have an interesting verse here. I guess that's mine. The life of every living thing is in the blood, and that is why the Lord has commanded that all blood be poured out on the altar to take away the people's sins. Blood, which is life, takes away sins. Hold on. We read back in Hebrews 10, the blood of bulls and goats can... Cannot. Never take away sin. Uh-oh. What are we going to do here? Bible conflict with Bible? Well, it sounds like it if, if you just took it very superficially. Why would those ancient people believe that, the blood, that life was in the blood? Now, those of us who've studied anatomy and physiology and looked them under the microscope and so forth, we know that most of what's in the blood is dead. Most of it, only a small part of it is actually alive. The red blood cells, the, the nucleus from it, which makes it alive, leaves it before it leaves the, the, the marrow, and it goes out just as a transporter of, of, of oxygen. There's, no, there's nothing alive there. There's so many metabolic processes going on in there, we can't really call it dead. <laughs> well, it's not fully alive either. It brings it, life. It's not going it to replicate. It's no, it's not. Necessary. And that's, remember okay. that one of the rules for something to be alive, it has to be replicate. So we've got problems here. One of the shocking things about reading, well, well, let me just be clear now. I think it was very, very clear to ancient people that if someone was seriously injured, or if an animal was killed, what happens? Almost the first thing that happens is the blood comes pouring out. And pretty soon, the creature is dead. So what would they conclude? That's life, 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 must life must be in the blood. Yeah. So I, I think that that's why we have it like this, and that's a very rational thing uh, for them to say at that point in time. One of the shocking things about reading the book of Leviticus is that there was virtually never any explanations for why they were doing what they were doing. Is it really possible that a group of slaves recently taken from a grossly pagan society would automatically understand the significance and explanation of each of those sacrifices? 
wouldn't a clear explanation be the most important part of the ritual? So why all the details of the ritual with virtually no explanation in the Bible? Was Israel also given explanations verbally? But, you know, you got these cultures, I mean, the children of Israel were coming out of, not very far out, of, of pagan cultures. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you spend time explaining uh, what's wrong with them? And then you come, like I mentioned earlier, with uh, uh, Micah 6, 6 through 8. Uh, but the, the greatest thing you could do for your deity was to offer even your firstborn. Mm -hmm. And you think your God like like songs and, you, and, you, and, and implica, or imprecations, prayers. Yeah, but so, it's go ahead. One would hope that Moses and Aaron and Miriam and other leaders were setting up schools and talking to the people about what these things meant. Maybe they just wrote down the the, the things that the people wouldn't remember. Maybe they actually were taught. Well. I have often wondered why, instead of a, a, a tent being built out there, why didn't God make a bunch of schoolrooms? Sabbath schoolrooms. <laughs> yes, Sabbath schoolrooms. Wouldn't that seem more, more logical to us in our day? And, and wealth of backgrounds and felt of animals. <laughs> yeah. But we already looked at Hebrews 10, which said that these sacrifices never take away sin. So how do we reconcile these two passages? Well, I've already suggested one reason why they thought that the life was in the blood. Do you agree with the following statement from the Bible study guide for Monday? Blood was key to the whole process of atonement, the means by which we sinners can be made right with the Holy God. Was the blood important because it cost a life and was intended to impress upon the people how serious sin was? All right, that's, I, that's mis misleading at best. All the way back in the days of Adam and Eve, that first sacrifice and even the first few sacrifices must have been heart-wrenching. Did the children of Israel come to understand that sin directly leads to death? And was that the point? Do we today, looking back to the sacrifice of Christ, understand the implications of his death? Hebrews 4, who's next? Tim, I think that might be yours. My turn. Okay, Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 11. Now God has offered us the promise that we may receive that rest he spoke about. Let us take care then that none of you will be found to have failed to receive that promised rest. For we have heard the good news just as they did. They heard the message, but they did, but it did them no good, because when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. We who believe then do receive that rest which God promised. Is it just as he said, I am angry and made solemn promise? They will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. He said this even though his work had been finished from the time he created the world. For some, excuse me, for somewhere in the scriptures, this is said that the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day for all his work. Or excuse okay. me, from all his work. Let me interrupt here for a second. This gets a little confusing. Yeah, and you need to read it over and over a few times in order to sort of realize it. He's saying, look, God created this rest back at creation. Now he's trying to instruct the children of Israel on their way from Egypt to Canaan. And he's giving them this rest. And this is not a new rest. This is rest that they've had, they were supposed to have had from the time of creation. So he, they certainly had it before, before Sinai. They mm -hmm. had it with the manna. Mm -hmm. And before that too. Yeah. Okay, Jim. This same, excuse me, this same matter is spoken of again. They never entered that land where it would have given them rest. For who, for who no, first, those, excuse those, me, those who first heard the good news did not receive that rest because they did not believe. There is then others who are allowed to receive it. 
This is shown by the fact that God sets another day, which is called today. Many years later, he spoke of it to David in the scripture already quoted. If you hear God's voice today, do not be stubborn. If Joshua had given the people the rest that God had promised, God would not have spoken later about another day. Now let's, let's stop and look at that for a moment. This is a verse that's used many times by people who want to say the Sabbath doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, why would they say that? Well, God would not have spoken later about another day. And what's the other day? Well, they would like to say Sunday. Okay. As it is. However, there still remains for God's people a rest like God's resting on the seventh day. For those who receive that rest, which God promised, will rest from their own work, just as God rested from his. Let us then do our best to receive that rest so that no one of us will fail as they did because of the lack of faith. Okay. Of now, their lack of faith. Several times it mentions specifically no belief, lack of faith. How does that fit in with this whole rest idea? If you really want rest, you need to come and, and security and safety and peace. You need to do what Jesus did. I just thought of this as appropriate an example. In the middle of that terrible storm, on the Sea of Galilee, what was Jesus doing? Sleeping. Sir. Sleeping. He wasn't worried about anything because he knew his father. He had a direct connection. Nothing was going to happen to him. Then he could just mm. calm the storm by speaking to yep. it. Yeah. The carpenter stood up and said, come on, guys, you're a fisherman, you know. <laughs> you know, amazing. Peace be still, bam, just like that. And in that area, they worship the wind. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so the, the, the disciples were stunned. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they knew that they worshiped wind in that area. Yes, yes. Yeah, and so getting back to our point here, if we had the kind of relationship to God that Jesus had, would we worry about things that were going on around us? In what sense did they lack faith? Today we believe that faith implies a special relationship with God. What was their problem so that they did not have a meaningful relationship with God? Before getting to Hebrews 4, the writer of Hebrews gave a very serious warning in Hebrews 3, 7 through 19. So then as the Holy Spirit says, if you hear God's voice today, do not be stubborn as your ancestors were when they rebelled against God, as they were that day in the desert when they put him to the test. There they put me to the test and tried me, says God, although they had seen what I did for 40 years. And so I was angry with those people and said, they are always disloyal and refuse to obey my commands. I was angry and made a solemn promise. They will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. Okay, let's stop here for a minute. So God is upset, he gets angry, and he's ready to zap them, right? He should have. <laughs> so what do we mean when we say God is angry? He's ready to give them up. He's ready to give them up. He steps back. And he's willing to let them do what they insist on doing. He's and passionate about it. It isn't that he turns his back on him. He just, he's... He's crushed. Yeah, yeah he, he, he attempted everything he can do to try to communicate, and they turn, their, turn him away, or they turn him And away Satan's standing there saying, these people want to follow me. They want to go my way. They want their own selfish plans for their lives. God says... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you're, you, 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 they seem to be, that's what they seem to be choosing. I think we're missing the point. Yeah. They are saved when they were baptized, when they went through the Red, red, um, red, red, sea. red sea, right? So they're once saved, they're always saved. We don't have to struggle with this yeah. anymore. Where'd you come up with that? <laughs> yeah. 
Sarcasm. You're making up. <laughs> no, that's oil. Yeah, but the uh, people are, are going to get the wrong impression here. This morning I was walking with Bill Banelli. You know that name. We talked this sadness. Bill, once saved, always said. Today he says, my thinking is changing. No. <laughs> once saved, always said. This is serious business. Look, the entire world, Christian world, believes in this. Yeah. 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 Believe it. That's it's a fantasy. A fantasy that, that yeah. they've been misled. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. Yeah, he brought up Sabbath. I said, I don't want to talk about Sabbath now. Let's sure. we'll talk later. That's yeah. the last thing we're going okay. to talk Great. about. But anyways, go on, my, my fellow, fellow believers, we carefully, be careful that no one among you has a heart so evil and unbelieving as to turn away from the living God. Instead, in order that none of you be deceived by sin and become stubborn, you must help one another every day. As long as the word today is in the scripture applies to us. For we all are partners with Christ if we hold firmly to the end, the confidence that we had at the beginning. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that confidence we had in the beginning. This is what the scripture says. If you hear God's voice today, do not be stubborn. And your ancestors were when they rebelled against God. Who were the people who heard God's voice and rebelled against him? All those who were led out of Egypt by Moses. With whom was God angry for 40 years? With the people who sinned, who fell down dead in the desert when God made his solemn promise they will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. Of whom was he speaking? Of those who rebelled, we see then that they were not able to enter the land because they did not believe. So, let's think about that in terms of their context. We know that if, I mean, and you can look at the whole history of, of the Jews in the Old Testament. Every time they went out to do battle with somebody, if they followed the Lord's instructions, and, 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 and he guided them. He said, yeah, go and do this. What happened? How successful were they? I mean, there were times when they came back and they, and they claimed they didn't lose a single soldier. What happened in the times when they went out without God's guidance? Disasters. Decimated. So, you know, what we're saying, we're saying if you don't trust God to guide you, if you aren't willing to consult him and let him guide you and tell you which way to go, what's going to happen to you? What's going to happen to us? Hmm. The example is there, right? As we read, uh, it seems quite clear that the children of Israel did, did not believe or trust God enough to faithfully follow his directions. Would that be true of us also? As we read Hebrews 4, 3 again, there seems to be specifically a relationship between rest and faith. Hebrews 4, 2 and 3. For we have heard the good news, just as they did. They heard the message, but it did them no good, because they, when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. We who believe then do receive the rest which God promised. It is just as he said, I was angry and I made a solemn promise. They will never enter the land where I gave them rest. I would have given them I, rest. Yes, I would have given them. Okay. He said this even though his work had been finished from the time he had created the world. So Paul is saying, he, Paul is still comparing. He says, you know, God did his work. He finished it faithfully. He rested. Now he comes out. He's trying to work with these people. He's trying to say, just follow my guidance. How are we ever going to get to the rest if you don't follow my guidance? But they wouldn't listen. Yeah. yeah. How can an understanding of what it means to be saved by the blood of Jesus help us enter into the kind of rest that we can have in Jesus knowing that we are saved by grace and not by works? We're saved by a gracious God. Mm -hmm. and, and the great saving is education. So those not last a, two sentences were from the teacher's Bible study guide. Well, yeah. that's why I've said it, be, corrected, yes. because the Bible study guide is distorted. Mm -hmm. Do we understand what it means to be saved by the blood? 
there's a very interesting parallel between Hebrews 4, 4 to 7, and 9, Psalms 95, 8 to 11, which we won't take time to read right now. These two passages seem to suggest that a lack of faith led to people being stubborn. Why would that be? And the author of Hebrews contrasted God's rest on the seventh day of creation to the lack of rest that the children of Israel experienced in the wilderness. What is the comparison between these two? Of course, we know that because of their lack of faith and their rebellion against God, that generation of people who left Egypt, everyone over the age of 20 except Caleb and Joshua, perished in the wilderness. Moses, of course, was given a vision of Canaan and then taken to heaven before the Israelites entered to Canaan. Notice that the author of Hebrews picked up the expression today as if something needed to be done right away. But that idea was first suggested a thousand years before Christ. Does it have any urgency for us today? How long has it been now since, since the days of, a, of David to our time? Long time. 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so does all of this have any urgency for us in our day? People have used Hebrews 4 to argue both for the keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath and against it, which is, going, which is a way of showing that what? Things can be twisted. Either way you want, the way you want them. Depends on your theological yeah. spectacles, your yes. paradigm, your... Those who want to argue against the keeping of the Sabbath suggest that whatever it means, it was only for the Jewish people. Paul de dealt with that issue in Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Gordon? It is through faith that all of you are God's children in union with Christ Jesus. You were baptized into union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. So how do we become descendants of Abraham? You have to have the right physical blood in your veins. Yeah, you just have to follow the Christ. Trust the Lord. The real issue in Hebrews 4 is not whether we should keep the seventh day Sabbath or not. The real issue is that the rest God wants us to focus on is that eternal perfect rest that God has planned for faith believers since the time of the creation. But the seventh day Sabbath is supposed to be a, a tiny foretaste of that perfect end time rest. So if we really were focused on that perfect end time rest and we wanted to have a little taste of it right now, what do we do? We keep the Sabbath, right? So what does it mean to rest in Christ? In our modern world, it seems that people are encouraged to be self-made, hardworking, go-getters, no matter what their field might be. Doesn't that rest sound out, doesn't rest sound out of tune with that ideal? We're not always willing to come to Jesus with our trials and difficulties. Sometimes we pour out troubles into human ears and tell our afflictions to those who cannot help us and neglect to confide all to Jesus who is able to change the sorrowful way of paths of joy into paths of joy and, and peace. Uh, I, I work in a government funded or partially funded uh, clinic mostly dealing with low-income people. And I mean, there's almost, sometimes it seems like there's not a person there that does need counseling of one kind or another. Just amazing. I think the rest of us need counseling too. Us? <laughs> really? I do. <laughs> Self-denying, self-sacrificing gives glory and victory to the cross. The promises of God are very precious. We must study His Word if we would know His will. The words of inspiration, carefully studied and practically obeyed, will lead our feet in, feet in a plain path where we may walk without stumbling. Oh, that all ministers and people would take their burdens and perplexities to Jesus, who is waiting to receive them 
and to give them peace and rest. He will never forsake those who put their trust in him. Signs of the Times, March 17, 1887. That was just about the time she was coming back from Europe. So I don't know whether she wrote that in Europe or whether she wrote that just after she got back. Just before the 1888 General Conference. Yeah, very shortly before the... Mm -hmm. Okay, can you, dear youth, now here's a special comment she wrote to the young people. So that should be something we would be concerned about. Can you, dear youth, look forward with joyful hope and expectation to the time when the Lord, your righteous judge, shall confess your name before the Father and before the holy angels? The very best preparation you could have for Christ's second appearing is to rest with firm faith in the great salvation brought to us at his first coming. You must believe in Christ as a personal savior. That's Ellen White in Youth Instructor, which was our earliest uh, journal for, for young people, January 28, 1897. Now, let me just stop and ask a question about all of that, what he says about to the young people and so forth. We, we sometimes say, and we need to think about the implications of this, was there any reason for Jesus to come the first time if he doesn't have any plans to come back? What do you think? Now, that's an important question because if you believe that all you have to do to be saved is just for Jesus to pour out his blood, he didn't need to come back. You're saved because he paid the price. So we say that his coming the first time was to teach us some important lessons so we can prepare ourselves for the second coming. And who, go ahead. Many people, even during his time, didn't have a concept that he was coming back the second time. Yeah. They were looking forward to his coming, but not the second time, so. We have often discussed the fact that atonement means at one meant, or reconciliation. And it is talking about our return to a right relationship with God. Do you have an idea of what it means to be reconciled to God? What difference would that make in your life? Was there ever a time where mankind was in a state of conciliation with God? If they were never there, you can't become reconciled. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was all. It was from the yeah, time well, of Adam. Ever yeah, since the, the time, time of Adam, Adam yeah. so, so you, this idea of reconciled is not the best word yeah. uh, because you, they were, mankind was really not in a state of conciliation. Well, well for for at least a few minutes or hours, <laughs> they were. Yeah. We don't know they, how they, long They were not was. born imperfect, it was created imperfect. They had everything that ne necessary, but they, it would didn't take them long to give it up. Well, it's, sure, it's certainly true that as a human race, we need to be reconciled to God. What difference would that make in your life? We recognize that our situation is very different from that of the children of Israel, wandering in the wilderness for those 40 years. I've had a chance to travel across that wilderness with a group and understand how dry and God-forsaken it seems to be. What kind of challenges do we face today that might be comparable to some of the challenges they face? Notice these words from our Bible study guide. That would be Charles. Christ providentially delivers us from sin's slavery, leads us through the waters of baptism, nourishes us by the manna of his word, and quenches our raging thirst in the desert of this world through his own life. Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. I, I just enjoyed when you talked about quenches our raging thirst in the desert of this world through his own life. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of young people, very few of them are Adventists, and so many of them drink coffee. So I have a big transparent water bottle, so you, you know, can see right through it. So I say, because I love cold water, really cold water, 
So I said, excuse me a minute, I have to go get my transparent coffee. <laughs> they, they all smile. <laughs> so, yeah. Would you consider the book of Leviticus to be the instructions which God gave to Moses about how things were to be done in the sanctuary? Leviticus 5, 5 to... Well, hold on. Paul said on more than one occasion that the events that happened back then are supposed to be examples for us. Try to imagine yourself back there observing at least, maybe not participate, but observing in, Im in imagination what happened at the sanctuary. Okay, Myra? Sorry, I jumped ahead there. Uh, Leviticus 5, 5 and 6. When a person is guilty, he must confess his sin. And as a penalty for his sin, he must bring to the Lord a female sheep or goat as an offering. The priest shall offer the sacrifice for the man's sin. Wow. Okay. Again, lots of blood, right? Yeah. The, child of, the children of Israel had just come out of slavery and were ve very concrete in their thinking. What do we mean when we say well, someone is concrete in their thinking? They don't think outside Rigid. the box. <laughs> well, they don't think abstractly. They don't think abstractly. And what Everything does that mean? Everything is literal. And there it is right there in front There's of you. There's no metaphor, no simile. So if someone tells you, okay, those sins, your sins are transferred from you onto that lamb, oh, okay. No question. Their sanctuary service was a sandbox illustration of the plan of salvation. The people could go to the tabernacle with their lamb and confess their sins on the head of that lamb. They were told that their sins were transferred through the blood of the lamb to the sanctuary. On the Day of Atonement, those sins were in symbol, transferred to the head of the scapegoat. They could watch that scapegoat be taken away into the wilderness, never to be seen again. This is a very concrete way to try to describe the plan of salvation. Notice these words from Ellen White. This is from Great Controversy, page 418. And, uh, this is a fairly lengthy passage, so maybe you read a couple of paragraphs and we'll share it with you, okay? The ministration of the earthly sanctuary consisted of two divisions. The priest ministered daily in the holy place, while once a year the high priest performed a special work of atonement in the most holy for the cleansing of the sanctuary. Day by day, the repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle and placed his hand upon the victim's he head, confessed his sins, thus in figure transferring them from himself to the innocent sacrifice. The animal was then slain. Without shedding of blood, says the apostle, there is no remission of sin. The life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. As There's we the read. verse which we read earlier. The broken law of God demanded the life of the transgressor, the blood representing the forfeited life of the sinner whose guilt the victim bore was carried by the priest <coughs> excuse me, into the holy place and sprinkled before the veil, behind which was the ark containing the law that the sinner had transgressed. And the presence of God, I might add. By this ceremony, the sin was, through the blood, transferred in figure to the sanctuary. In some cases, the blood was not taken into the holy place, but the flesh was to be eaten by the priest, as Moses directed the sons of Aaron, saying, God hath given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, Leviticus 10, 17. Both ceremonies alike symbolize the transfer of the sin from the penitent to the sanctuary. Symbolized the transfer of the sin, okay? A lot of in figure symbolized and mm -hmm. a lot of as, uh, calls for abstract thinking. Okay, so here's the larger paragraph that I was thinking about a moment ago. Imagine yourself returning home to your tent after having completed that ceremony. Would you feel relief? Would you feel forgiven? We, of course, believe that in our day the life and death of Christ takes the place of our offering lambs. And I will say that I had a series of Bible study classes with a, a couple for quite, I mean, for, man, I think it went on for a couple of years. And that young man was raised in a certain church where 
these very concrete ideas are presented. And he would say, and he would go to church on Sunday and he would confess his sins before the priest there. And he would say, he, he prayed as a child even, if I'm going to die, let me die on my way home from church on Sunday morning because then I think I might have a chance of being saved. Well, Christ's grace is unmerited, undeserved, unearned. This is our Bible study guide. Jesus died the agonizing, painful death that the lost sinners will die. Adult Bible, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 147. Okay, so, Jim? Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which we ha he had no share that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours that we might receive the, the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 25. Notice this more detailed description of what actually happened at the cross in the Desire of Ages. So here's a little bit longer passage that I mentioned earlier. Maybe we could each read one paragraph. Charles, you want to read the first one there? Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor. Now we know that he wasn't a transgressor, don't we? That is right. He but never he sinned. Counted okay. As a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressed upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Remember, we've said many times that the wrath of God is his turning away and loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway, thus leaving us, leaving them to the inevitable awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. So what's happening here? Jesus is being treated as if he was a sinner. So, and what our sins, Isaiah 59 verse 2, separate us from God. So Jesus is being separated from God, okay? And that's what killed him. Yeah. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of the guilt he bears, he can, cannot see the Father's reconciling face. So he feels himself being torn away from the Father. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in the hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Now I'm going to interrupt there again. Think of what Jesus has been through. The crucifixion, the beatings, the raw back from all the, everything he's been through. And now he sees, we separate, we choose to separate ourselves from God when we sin. Jesus never choose to, chose to separate himself from God by sin. But now he, he, he can't see through the veil of sin. He, he's being treated as if he were a sinner. And so he was so disturbed by that apparent sin, it wasn't his sin, but that apparent sin that was separating him from, from the Father, that the rest of his pain was hardly felt. What would happen if we felt like that every time we were tempted to sin? Okay, Myra, would you be willing to pick that up there? Yeah. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, to tell him of his Or tell him. What? Or tell him. Or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. 
He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation would be eternal. Mm. I just, that just. Wow. I, I, that uh, sentence always gets me. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was that sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter. It broke the heart of the Son of God. Gordon? With amazement, angels witnessed the Savior's despairing agony. The hosts of heaven veiled their faces from the fearful sight. Inanimate nature expressed sympathy with its insulted and dying author. The sun refused to look upon the awful scene. Its full bright rays were illuminating the earth at midday when suddenly it seemed to, to be blotted out. I try to imagine that. Here are the people mocking at Jesus and all this kind of stuff, and all of a sudden, bam, the light's out. Complete darkness, like a funeral pall, and, and enveloped the cross. There was darkness over all the land until onto the ninth hour. Now, the ninth hour would be 3 p.m. They started counting the day at 6 o'clock in the morning. Go ahead. There was no eclipse or other natural cause for this darkness, which was as deep as midnight without moon or stars. It was a miraculous testimony given by God that the faith of after generations might be confirmed. In that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. Hidden from whom? From Jesus. He makes darkness his pavilion and conceals his glory from human eyes. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. Was he there? Absolutely he was there. But Jesus couldn't feel him. He couldn't sense his presence. The Father was with his Son, yet his presence was not revealed. Had his glory flashed forth from the, crowd, from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. He trod the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with him. We've got just a few seconds left. Do you want to read a couple sentences here, Jim? In the thick darkness, God veiled the last human agony of his son. All who had seen Christ in his suffering had been convicted of his divinity. That face, once beheld by humanity, was never forgotten. As the face of Cain expressed his guilt as a murderer, so the face of Christ revealed innocence, serenity, benevolence, the image of God. Okay, we need to stop there. I hope that you have gotten a new picture, as I have every time I read this passage, of what really meant what happened at the cross. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have seen here some incredible examples from the Old Testament and the reality experienced in the New Testament at the crucifixion. Help us to take these things to heart and think about if really every time we choose to sin, we are actually, in effect, crucifying Jesus again, would we do it? That should be our thought every time we are tempted. Help us, Jesus, to have that clearly in mind is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.